This conference will now be recorded. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are excited for you to join us today for our Biotechnical Advocacy Lab webinar. Um, today, we are partnering with the Beekeeper Group uh, to show you how to use different free design tools for um, advocacy purposes. For example, um, you know, in this environment, it is so important to increase your virtual presence. Um, and by Using these tools, you can do just that. So for example, you can add innovative graphics to your emails or websites or call to action. So we're really excited um, for all of you to be here today um, and learn about this. So today we have joining us Casey, who is a senior vice president at the Beekeeper Group. Uh, her expertise lies in branding, integrated media campaigns, and design thinking. Um, Casey co-founded and managed uh, creative services at Pivot Point Communications for eight years, where she specialized in branding, integrated public relations, and marketing campaigns. We also have Melanie joining us today. Uh, she is a designer at the Beekeeper Group, where she works on a variety of client projects from infographics to email designs to print work. Uh, Melanie attended college at uh, Tozen University and graduated with a bachelor's degree in art and design and with a concentration in graphic design. So excited for both of them to be here today. Um, please, if you have any questions throughout, use the chat box. We'll also have time um, to ask questions over video. So Casey, I will let you take it away. All right. Hi guys, um, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, welcome to designing for free tools and um, in, for uh, designing with free tools to engage supporters. Um, hold on a second, Let's see. All right, so as Ashley mentioned, um, I am the head of the design team at Beekeeper Group. I was really excited when they asked me to come on and talk about kind of using free tools for advocacy groups. Um, I know that a lot of you guys are kind of in the patient advocacy space, and then also some kind of uh, government relations um, jobs as well. And graphics may not be your second, like your second nature like it is to my team. Um, so we thought we'd kind of break down some things, kind of give you tools of design to then, and also kind of tricks of the trade that we use on a daily basis to then get into um, the tutorial that Melanie's gonna do. So a little bit of overview. Um, my team is basically a visual design team. So we, build graphics all day long, we build campaigns, we build websites. I wanna talk a little bit about visual design because that's what you're gonna be working on. Um, graphic design is kind of what our training is in, and it's the art, it's the design, it's the color theory, those kinds of things. We use those these days and apply it to visual communications, which is more designing for like um, larger platforms, like the multifaceted campaigns, those kinds of things, like branding, and then, um, and then distributing it across Facebook, Twitter, MailChimp, all those things that you guys are here to learn about making. Um, what we're gonna do today, because because my team works so much in the advocacy space, we're gonna kind of take design basics and then um, distill them down a little bit for what you need for to work in the advocacy space. For, sorry guys, you hear my, my dog and my children in the background, they're kind of excited I'm doing a presentation. Um, uh, what we can do in the, uh, what we do in the, for designing for advocacy more or less, is I'm making sure that we are building effective, impactful communications. Um, a lot of the design you kind of see out on the internet with all the visuals that are out there with digital screens and those kinds of things are um, targeting different things. But for you guys, we really, really focus on making sure we're building clear, effective, impactful work. Uh, so we've extracted some of the tools and some of the elements in our presentation to, to, to focus on those things. 
Um, so we're going to go through basics. We're going to go through setting yourself up for success, uh, how to actually build and execute some graphics in terms of uh, preparation and process, uh, risk and blockers, and then jumping into the actual tutorial uh, with Melanie. All right, uh, guys, we do have tools and tips throughout the document um, that we will be handing out as a worksheet afterwards. And I'll stop at the break of each one of these sections to, um, to look for questions if you have them. If you want to hold them to the end, that's totally fine. I want it to be as, um, as engaging and kind of get uh, you getting the most out of it that you can possible. All right, so for design basics, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the elements of design, um, some principles that we pulled that I think were, are they're really utilized in uh, advocacy design work, and then um, some kind of rules that we live by every day when we work. Um, so what you're looking at here on the left is your very classic set of elements of visual design. If you were to Google design elements, these are the big ones that pop up. The ones on the right are the ones that I want that I think are the most effective tools for you to use and respective elements for you to use in design work. Um, color, typography, and imagery. All those three, three things live in the major um, elements of design. So we're going to go through the rules, the, the roles of each one of these elements. Color. Color is one of the most powerful tools you, or elements you can use in design. Um, we use it for, its role is really for engagement, for emphasis, and for setting the tone. I mean, you can do a lot in calls to actions, those kinds of things, um, by pulling them out of your layouts with color. Um, and you can also do a lot of setting of, of, of tone setting with color, like beach tones, bright tones, alert tones, those kinds of things, and your kind of reds and greens and those guys. Um, I'm not going to get a whole lot into how to apply color. It's more about basic understanding how we use color. Um, the big things about color to know if you're kind of in and out of working in the, the kind of visual space are um, the color systems. It's a great place to start. RGB is for when you're using digital. It's the combination of light that makes the color. CMYK is for print. We won't get that far into it, so we're really kind of focusing on digital here, but that's what those letters mean. It's cyan, magenta, um, yellow, and key, which is black. Put them together in ink, and they make all your colors. Uh, PMS is Pantone matching system. We more or less use Pantone just for reference. Uh, lots of really big brands will use Pantone to make sure they're printing to the exact right color for brand consistency. We do more flexible in terms of branding that we we designate Pantone colors, we more or less print in CMY color, CMYK colors to match. Um, one of the hardest things about colors to get started when you're trying to, building a, trying to build a color palette is, um, is how do you get started building a color palette? Is, uh, we often will pull um, colors from photographs, colors from other, other color combinations that we see. We're not kind of like reinventing color and the combinations that are there every time. Hopefully you guys have some sort of color system established for what, what you're working on. If not, and you have free reign i'm always like start with if you're if you're trying to work on something about a beach start with the beach photo and pull your corals and your ocean blues and your sands and stuff and we'll start um, setting a tone the main thing about color you want to pay attention to in execution is legibility um, the three tools that i have down at the bottom of the screen will help with that about balancing um, legibility of um, um, contrasting colors and those kinds of things color is more about what doesn't work as opposed to what does work because that's a wide open scale you want to make sure things don't clash and things can read well um, all right so moving on to the, the next element which is typography typography's role and when you're building it with um, when you're designing is really for information and communication you can also set the tone in terms of what uh what typefaces you use um, and then also order order on your page and structure on your page we can do that with scale um, and with layout uh, when you're starting a brand new fresh document, so you have no branding, no nothing, you always want to make sure you're designating something, a type basis for um, a header or display font, um, more or less for personality and like kind of calling things out, and then a, a body font, which is like a utility font. So something that is that can be really well read for heavier copy. Um, those can often be the same font. It's going to be more playing with scale and with uh, size and scale and layout and stuff, but you really want to make sure you're designating something for your titles and something for your body copy. Um, how to get started with this guy, I still use this to this day. It's a great trick. It's called the party trick. And like, think about when you're trying to look for typefaces, that if you're like carte blanche looking for brand new typefaces, um, you can um, like think of what you're doing. Like, let's say you're making an invitation for a barbecue, like envision what the barbecue looks like and pull out a typeface that feels like that barbecue or if you're doing something like the, like the lower one if you um if you are doing something like a holiday tea or a, or, a, or an invitation for a wedding or something think about what that wedding's going to look like and start you'll still be able to start matching 
the typeface with that. I use the word party to figure out what I want to do and then change out the word party and use it for whatever kind of layout I'm doing. I use it all the time still when I'm picking out typefaces for different things. It's just about association. Um, imagery. So imagery is a really big deal. Uh, its role, of course, uh, its role is for context. Um, I have a, a rising first grader who's just learning to read and he's, you know, one of the biggest tools for learning to read is um, picture power. So it's the same exact thing. It's like context of what you're we're putting on in your copy and your information and then what you can help back it up with in the, in the visual. Um, engagement, you know, really striking photography or really striking illustrations will always help a layout depending on how you use it. And they're also there to inform, um, you know, lots of connecting patients, for instance, like since you guys are in kind of patient advocacy, um, helping to tell the story with the photo and the word is really, really um, powerful. Uh, kinds of imagery, we basically break down into photographs, and more or less illustrations. And illustrations kind of cover everything from patterns and textures um, to graphics and icons and, and um, uh, visual graphics and anything you can basically draw and put on the screen. Uh, down to the bottom, I have tips here for where to find free images. Unsplash is a wonderful resource. It's a really large library, of free um, well-shot stock photography if you need them. Um, Unique photography is always more impactful if you have it, but I get it. Not everybody has wonderfully shot, well-captured unique photography. Um, those are good resources to use. All right, those are the three big things that, that you use when you are building a layout or a design piece of any sort. Um, here are the two main principles that I, I, when we were thinking about doing this presentation, that I thought would, uh, it's the best place for you guys to start, which just hierarchy and composition. On the eight are the big eight principles that really kind of define what we do in a day um, when we're laying out any kind of any kind of artwork. Um, but these two, I think, are the where where I start and are the strong. So hierarchy is what what its role is. Is it helps you provide structure and order to what you're building, and what that really does is helps guide the user's eye or the or the person's eye who's reading it. User sounds so. Um, distant um the person's eye through what you're what you're building so like if you were to you've got about five seconds for someone to understand or grasp what you're looking at online and then they're on to the next thing um, um that um hierarchy really helps you understand and how to have like have a starting point for them to enter into a into a layout um, and hierarchy is not just size and scale it is color so like for instance in the top um the the top example that I have, like the difference of the before and the after is strikingly different in terms of bringing in color to help pop that piece out in front of everything else to understand that piece. Um, and then the one in the below is, is, is hierarchy with type. It's bringing in different typefaces and different colors to help understand that Jane Smith is the name on that page. And that's where your eye goes first. Um, okay, so the next one is composition. Composition's role is about organization and clarity um and really kind of helping you arrange and lay out your page um to the right the example here is about gridding the the link at the bottom is also about gridding gridding is just a really great way to get started because you start dropping things on a page and you don't really have a real plan um you can tell and it also helps helps uh cause for confusion on the layout so if you start, not everything needs to be completely gridded out but it is a wonderful place to start and knowing when to break the grid builds for stronger work I'm sorry, let's, we will get to the question at the end of the section. Thank you for asking though. I'm super excited that we've got one question so far. Um, okay, so these next couple of rules are things that my team, um, they use the, the principles and the elements all day long. These are kind of things that we live by in terms of our internal team building within advocacy is making sure that you're designing for impactful work. Um, big stuff is, let's, audiences. You guys know that, um, building for your audiences, especially because you're in the kind of health care healthcare space. You probably have an idea of who your audience is, but keeping that in mind where you're actually making the work is um, it's so important. Like it makes for just stronger, stronger work. It's, it's getting beyond the demographics. It's more about visualizing who is the person on the other end of the graphic or the, or the poster or whatever you're making. Um, if you dig deeper into what, how it may impact them, um, it really helps you pull out some better ideas. All right. Uh, purpose, having a clear idea of what you're building and what it's for um, is really, really important. I know some of you are probably like, this is an add-on of building graphics for your, for whatever else is the rest of your job. Um, and you may not always get an idea of what it's going to be going for, what it's going to be doing, like whether it's you're making a flyer for the 
the break room at the office or you're sitting at a social graphic somewhere. Understanding clearly what you're doing and why you're doing it is super important. It helps you connect to the audience, helps you dig a little bit deeper, and it helps you really kind of um, like focus down on the impact that you can provide with the graphics that you're building. All right, and then consistency. So this is what we do a lot of, of in a lot of the work that we do, and I imagine you guys are going to be doing this too. If you're building one graphic, you're going to be building probably more than more than one graphic to share on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and those guys. Um, it's building consistency across the work that you do, whether it's across your brand or whether it's across like you're building an invitation and you want to put it in an email header and you want to put it out on an Instagram story and you want to put it on Facebook. Making sure that those three images work together um, because the size of Instagram is a little bit different. And that's where the flexibility comes in, is making sure that you're building um, and you aren't too attached to an idea that you have room for flexibility. All right. And then the last one is checking for what we call craft, which are four of the other uh, principles out of design. This is more of a gut check thing of like looking at what you're building and spelling out composition, a check for composition, repetition, alignment, and proximity. And those are all available at that link um, below. He has a pretty good article about um, the eight um, elements, or eight principles, sorry. Okay, all right, so now I'll reach out and we'll see this question. I'm applying these lessons uh, mostly to designing PowerPoint slides. Do you have a balance considering all color options with using three to four brand colors as prescribed to me by the communications team? You know, my thing is, I think I'm, I think I'm understanding your question, is you don't have to use all the colors all the time. Um, you know, the, you can, that's part of hierarchy in a way, is like understanding what if you have, let's say the red, blue, green, and yellow, and your red is super bright, hold it for emphasis. Don't always use it on everything. Um, it's more about, and if you have those four colors assigned, you might you probably have more um, instruction of how they're used in terms of tone and stuff. If, you're ready to go. if not, um, you want to kind of keep your brighter colors for emphasis and tone down the rest of them for use. That's how I would find it. Hopefully that answers what we're asking. If not, we can revisit, revisit it at the end. Okay, uh, moving on to the next section. So this section, oh, excellent, okay. Um, so this section is more of like gathering and prepping and kind of lessons learned from my team and from my past experience that um, uh, we feel like it's really helpful. Just You may not know these things. Some of them are intuitive, some are not, before you sit down and start building something because design is a very vulnerable process. It's like you're taking an idea out of your head and you're putting it on a page and then on the internet for everyone to see. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get easier, it gets, it gets very intimidating. Um, and there are things that you can do ahead of time. Thank you. Right. So, um, what you, things you need to know before you get started, like do you have content that you need? Do you have the time that you need? Do you have the ability, like the software, or the capability of the software? Are you, this is more about making sure you aren't uh, finding out what if I stay here? Because you can see things that look really cool online, and then be really hard to execute. Or you're like, I can do that, and I want to try it. Give a shot, and that's fine. It's more of a gut check about looking at those three, those three C's to make sure um, you're setting yourself up for success. Um, the next thing is knowing where you're distributing these things, um, knowing what social platforms you're putting them on, knowing the dimensions of those social platforms. Those change all the time. Knowing those in advance helps you plan out your work a lot more efficiently. Um, file formats, knowing what's going to post to Facebook, what's going to post to Twitter, um, those kinds of things, what's going to work best in your email template. Um, knowing those in advance also helps you think about what software you're going to use and how you're going to build your article. Um, and then those things also help you plan for not building it twice. The worst is when you're like, you've built out this beautiful Facebook a social share and then you have to turn around and repurpose it in four other sizes and you didn't think in advance of planning out across a couple of different um, artboard sizes at one time. The links in the bottom of here are the most up-to-date dimensions um, and file formats that I could find as of like this week. So the HubSpot is a wonderful resource for those kinds of things. All right, um, so do you have the assets that you need? One of the things that is the most distracting thing to do when you're building a, a new kind of campaign or, or, or layout of any sort is not having what you need in advance like the colors, the images, the logos, um, the fonts that you need, the color palettes. That's the stop start is what you really want to try to avoid when you're sitting down to actually build something. Um, and these are just a simple list of things that you um, you want to ask for ahead of time. If you have a branding guideline, awesome. That is the place to start. It should tell you how to use most of the stuff that's in there. Um, if you don't, the big guys are, do you have images? Do you have any direction on images, logos, fonts, and color palette? 
Um, and also make sure you're including all logos, not just your own logo, logo. Like if you're partnering with someone, you make sure you have the right logo and the right logo file for, for that before you get started. Um, if not, the stop start can waste a lot of time. All right, and then software. What software are you gonna use once you've got all your stuff gathered and you're ready to sit down and start figuring out what you're gonna do? Um, what kind of software are you gonna use? Free tools, we are looking at Canva today. Um, Google Suite, more or less Google Slide is actually a pretty decent visual builder because you can move your text boxes around and um, and kind of play around in the layout and change the size of the slide pretty well. Um, that's a really good tool to use. My team uses Adobe Suite all day long, every day. Microsoft, um, not so much Word, but more PowerPoint. You can also basically a visual builder. If you needed to build a flyer or a social graphic in there, you can change the dimensions of the slide, lay it out how you want, and then export it into something really simple like a JPEG. Um, and it has um, pretty good flexibility in what you can do with it. Um, Canva is wonderful. It's a newer tool. We're going to go do a deeper dive into it in a little bit, um, but it's probably your best bet, I think, in terms of free software. Great. All right. So now we have gathered everything you need, and now we are going to start um, building our our actual like concept, right? So you've gathered all your stuff. You're here. Um, this is a very simplified approach to kind of the creative process. We use this observe, ideate, execute, and test on pretty much everything that we build, whether it's a one-off social graphic for like an invitation or if it's a full-blown website. Um, and the way that this, the way this is kind of created is, um, is design is so much about decision making. You don't, you don't realize it when you're doing this, but you're, as we go through this process, you're making very, very um, big decisions to get down to the, down to the execution phase. Um, and this is broken down to help you keep moving along like that. Uh, so observation is basically research. It is starting with what you've looked at, what your team has built in the past, if you have anything. Lessons learned there or good ideas, all great. Um, you want to gather ideas. My, my team kind of lives in Pinterest boards. Um, I have God, hundreds of Pinterest boards for different projects. So just collecting things that I thought were neat or wanted to show somebody. It's more or less just a mood board, um, all gathered together. And then once you have good ideas, um, yes, you will absolutely get access to the slides. And we also have a, um, a worksheet that has just the tips and tools um, that, that are at the bottom of the screen. Um, a good thing, what you want to do when you get to the bottom, to the kind of end of where you think you have some ideas in your head of observation and research is talk it out with teammates. When, when you're designing something, you're getting a concept together in your head and you're like, oh my God, it's amazing. This is going to be brilliant. And then you go to kind of convey it to somebody else. You don't know what you're talking about. Because everyone else is going to see what you're building. You want to check in with other people every step of the way, um, which brings us into the ideation phase which is conveying an idea or try to get a layout out on a page. Um, the best way to do this, I highly recommend, and as soon as I say this, everyone's going to say that they, they're not artists, they don't sketch. Um, sketching is the best way to get concepts down on a page. Um, even if you are scribble scratching, that is totally fine. It's connecting the brain to something outside of you, in front of you, um, and it helps get the ideas flowing, and it's fast. This is actually a sketch from an old notebook of mine. Um, that I spend my day, you know, flipping the screen around and showing it to Melanie of like, what do you think of this? What do you think of this idea? Um, if you're not comfortable sketching, you can do kind of rough comps, which is like gathering images that you maybe aren't allowed to use off of the internet, um, you know, in your actual social graphics and compiling them together into kind of a collage to help you figure out how you're going to put things on the page, what your ideas are going to be. It's all just kind of documenting what you're doing. Um, and then again, once you hit this phase, it's really important to to grab a colleague and um, and talk out your ideas here because one thing that we we I talk about a lot with my team is like we sketch to communicate not sketch for, for artistry um, because we're getting things out of our heads and getting out on the page is very very important. All right, from here we are ready to execute. Whether you've realized it or not, you've made a lot of decisions from kind of your observation and research and gathering stuff, ideation. You're doing a lot of thinking. And now you have a pretty good, hopefully, a pretty good plan of what you're going to do on the page. Um, good things to have as you get starting, because what, what, what is the worst is when you sit down with a blank canvas or blank artboard or whatever, blank sheet of paper, and you don't have an idea on the page. It's a really kind of a stop. You can lose a lot of time and a lot of confidence in what you're doing. If you're prepped to get to this point, you've got a better shot of being, um, being satisfied with what you're building. So 
to get here, um, have a checklist of the must-haves that you have nearby to make sure you don't forget something when you kind of get in the zone and you're moving your things around the page. Um, keep your sketch close by because you want to keep those those original ideas that you have right next to you as you're building. Um, for me, I kind of start blocking things out on a page to help kind of approach the screen so it's not as intimidating. And then I also build a lot of what I do in grayscale. Um, color, again, is a super powerful tool that um, I, I, don't, I don't advise starting with color because it's, you're making too many choices at one time. Get everything down on the page, get your scale of your typography, get your layout where you want to put your photo, you got a block where you want to put your photo, you got some text in there, and then start bringing in the color because it'll really, really, really change your, your, your concept a lot. And I know this sounds really rigid in terms of process, but don't be afraid to experiment at this point. If you see something you didn't really think about in your sketches and you want to explore, totally fine. Just keep in mind, you know, you don't want to get um, off into the wrong direction too far. And then obviously show some body, so show your colleagues at this point too, which brings us into the testing phase. Um, testing is, is what it sounds like. You want to show people, get feedback. Um, you also want to check for like legibility, contrasting of colors, making sure what's building on your screen when you upload it somewhere, um, it's, it looks exactly the same or pretty close to the same what you had. Um, great great tap tools are five second design test, which is literally showing someone the graphic that you made and if they can grasp what you're doing um, or what you're trying to get across in terms of information or calls to action in that five seconds, you're on, you're on the right track. Um, upload them, print them out. Uh, ask for proofs if you're doing something online. All those things are super, super important. What you're building is going out on the internet for like hopefully thousands of people to see. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't skip the testing part. And honestly, like if in this process of, of observation, um, ideation, execution, and test, you're probably going observation, ideation, execution, test, execution, test, execution, test a couple of times. You might go back to, up to ideation one or two points. Um, and again, show it, to, show it to colleagues. Like it never hurts to get this in front of somebody else to kind of get um, a difference of opinion or they may see something that you didn't see. I can't tell you how many things that I've built that I'm like, what do you think of this? And they're like, we don't know what you were trying to get across in, in, in that situation. Um, the, okay, so that is kind of, that is the simple, simplified design process. Um, that we use every every day. All right, last thing that I'm going to talk about before we get into the tutorial, um, now that you guys are all have you know, like, the process and all those things, um, is blockers and risks. These are pretty straightforward. Um, the creative process that I that I walked you through helps with intimidation because again, design is a very vulnerable thing. It's getting ideas out of your head and on the page. Um, don't be intimidated. You're not going to make like, like award-winning things on the first shot that you do. It's going to take time. Um, and but, but keep going. It's a really, really cool thing to build a graphic that someone, like, changes someone's life or changes the number of attendance at a conference or something. That's really cool to be part of that, that kind of, like, a mission or whatever. Um, refer back to your research and your audience all the time. You know, you will go off on a tangent, uh, which are rabbit holes or, or whatever, um, making sure that you're kind of staying on plan as much as you can with, caveat of like a little bit of experimentation at each each uh, step of the way. And then risks, uh, going too far in the wrong direction. That's why I keep talking about checking in with colleagues um, to make sure that you're kind of on the same wavelength as they are in terms of what you're building. Uh, taking too long, that comes, from, that comes from procrastination of not having what you need to get started or not having a process or, um, or going too far off in one direction. Um, and then mistakes. Mistakes are a big thing kind of in the visual space because once you do them, they are, they're there and everyone can see them. So have it proofed, what you're doing, step away, um, come back and proof it again, show it to someone else to proof it again um, because they are, they are very, very visual when you make mistakes. And then deadlines. Um, I mean, we're all kind of in the advocacy space, you know, the deadlines are very important. Um, but making sure that if you're working with someone else in terms of delivering a graphic or building something like an animator or videographer or even like a web um, like your webmaster or something um, to make sure you're paying attention to the deadlines that you are working on that it's not affecting the rest of the, the flow of things um, guys and that's that's it that's kind of that's kind of our 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 day more or less of how we work and what we do I hope this has been pretty helpful in terms of 
making design not as intimidating for you guys, as I know it's probably not what you signed up for, but they are super important and they're so powerful um, in terms of what you can get your message out with. So now we're gonna go into the tutorial section of this, because I know you guys are chomping at the bit to, to learn about um, Canva. And we chose Canva uh, because it is a free tool. It's a really nice interface. It's got a lot of kind of um, assets that you can use. Um, and it's, it's, it's pretty templatized as well, which uh, Melanie's gonna walk you through. So it's kind of a um, low entry, low skill entry in terms of like producing some really nice things. All right, Melanie, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Thanks, Casey. Uh, bear with us for a moment while we switch our screens. Okay, great. Just checking, everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, All right. great. So Casey, really, she uh, teed this up really well. I'm going to go through setting up an account. Then I'm just going to show you how to navigate through the website and all the different pages that you can look at. And then we'll go through three different tutorials. Okay, so this is the first page without logging in. So when you're signing up with an account, you can either sign up with Google, Facebook, or your email. So for today's purposes, I'm going to sign up with my email. So it's pretty straightforward. I am just signing up with my email. I think Melanie froze. I'm going to see if she's going to come back on to finish the tutorial. Yep, let's give her another minute to reconnect here. I think she lost her connection. You know, I guess if, if you have any questions right now while we're waiting for Melanie to come back online, um, I'm happy to start fielding some now if you have them. Um, we can also hold them again, do, do more questions at the end if, if there are any. Oh, glad, I'm glad that the um, the basic design lessons were were useful. You know, I was kind of we do those all day long, every day, and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't too much um, design. But but what I always feel like is people try to open these new softwares and use them, um, and they don't have any any like starting ground of how to build. So you can always open like you know Word and try to build something. You don't know what you're doing. It's because it is a pretty vulnerable thing. It's a little intimidating to get started. So with those basic elements and those basic principles, you can go a long, long way. Um, and you can always add on more from there. Like if you're interested in kind of the CRAP acronym that I gave is um, it's the next level of kind of design principles of starting to add that will just take your work to the next level. You can build a lot of things if you stick to just, um, you know, color type imagery and then hierarchy and, and, um, and composition. That's really kind of what you need in the advocacy space to make sure you're building impactful kind of effective work. Um, that is really clear on the messaging. Um, the rest of it is all kind of superfluous and for, and for beauty and those kinds of things to help engage 
but um, I'm glad that it was good. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or are we waiting for Melanie? You know, while we're waiting for her to reconnect, could you go over some of the differences between, you know, using Google and um, this platform and kind of the positive and negative aspects? I think that would be really helpful. That's a really good question. So we were kind of going back and forth this, uh, what, what tool to present up until almost yesterday, because we were on, um, you know, Canva, as I was starting to talk about, is really templated. Like if you really are uncomfortable in the, the kind of visual space, start with Canva because it has really well-designed templates already there. You can change out imagery. Uh, it's got good type pairings that, that, that work well together in there as kind of starters. Um, Google is also a really good tool to use because it's a little more flexible in terms of uploading your own um, content, like images, and um, but it also has access to Google fonts, but it's a little bit more of a blank canvas. Like if you open up some of the premium tools that we use, they are absolutely stark and you add everything in. Again, like design is about decision making. So in, in Canva, you're more or less shopping for templates that you want to start with. You can start on your own if you want to. Um, you, have, you have that flexibility in the visual builder, but it does have those kind of like pre-made things. You can kind of start seeing what you want in there and turn and changing like, it's also size and scale of type and that kind of stuff too that kind of helps you start seeing your layouts of what you're looking for and then customizing it. Um, I prefer Google Slides over PowerPoint just because it's a little bit easier, the interface is a little easier to use. Um, but I mean, if you guys are comfortable in PowerPoint, it's totally fine. You could, it's a visual builder at, in its nature. You can change the size and the shapes of the, of the slides and export them as, um, as JPEGs that you would need for whatever size. The one limitation, as Melanie's pulling her stuff up, um, the one limitation for Canva is the free version has, um, a kind of select set of fonts. It's not like if you have brand fonts, um, like let's say you, you guys use Helvetica and that's it for your brand. Um, Canva doesn't necessarily have Helvetica. They have something called Helvetica-ish, which kind of gets into a little bit of a consistency issue. But if you're starting from scratch, don't worry. Start with Canva. I apologize right, for that. I'm on the internet <laughs> right as uh, we switched over. <laughs> I got questions. Um, so it was I'm on a Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm on a mobile hotspot, so I apologize if it's a little spotty, but um, just bear with me. Uh, I just want to double check that you can see my screen. I think we might yeah. be looking at, we might have to re refresh the screen share, Natalia. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's try this again. So let's go and sign up with our email. I'm not sure how much you saw or heard until you logged me, but um, basically you can sign up with Google, Facebook, or just sign up with your email. And there isn't any extra steps to sign up. You just put your basic information in and then you are good to go. All right. So first it'll prompt you just to give a little more information. So for today, I'm just going to say we're creating an account. Then it'll prompt you to sign up for Canva Premium, which we maybe will do later. So it will start with our first design. And just for the sake of moving past this page, I'm gonna click Instagram post. But before we get started with, started with any designs, I wanna go back to the home page and just walk through the home page. So first, let's take a look at the top navigation. Right now, we're currently on the home page. And then the templates tab, it just gives a variety of different templates that you can choose from. This is not all the templates that they have, it just gives you a, a few choices to get started. The Discover tab is similar to the templates, except it lets you search through different assets that you can use within your designs. This is a great place to search for if you're looking for inspiration or any, any type of asset that you might wanna use on your design. This is also great for 
li liking any of these assets, similar to creating Pinterest boards, just like Casey referenced in her presentation, you can do that within this tab. The Learn tab is a great resource for if you get stuck while you're designing. Canva has a lot of different tutorials or how-tos or just resources in general that'll help you answer any questions you have. And finally, pricing, which is pretty self-explanatory. There are a bunch of different levels of pricing for Canva that give you, gives you different types of resources. Okay, great. So next, let's walk through this side navigation and then we'll get started on the tutorials. So right now, the default page that we start on is recommended for you. And the most important thing on this page is this search bar right here. Within the search bar, you can basically just click into this and then search for whatever you're designing for, and it'll come up with a template size for you. So let's say I wanted to create a Twitter post. I'm just going to type in Twitter post. And then it comes up with all of these different types, which are basically, it's the same sizing. It's just, it'll start you with these specific templates. And what's great about this search bar is when you hover over any of these options, it gives you the exact pixel dimensions for this specific template. And so that search bar is great because you can really search for any kind of standard design that you would think of. But say you don't want, you have something that's specific, a specific size, then you go over here and choose custom dimensions. And you can choose between pixels, inches, millimeters, and centimeters. And you just type that in and then create new design. So further down this page, it gives you a variety of different options of trending templates and then just different types of templates that you can either look at for using yourself or you can look at for inspiration. Okay, let's move on to the next tab, which is all your designs. So right now we haven't created anything yet, so this page is blank, but this is what, where you'll go when after you've created any designs, this is where they will live. All right, the brand kit page is, I would argue, one of the most useful uh, resources that Canva offers. I'm assuming that a lot of you are working with specific brands or one specific brand, and a lot of the time you'll just be using reusing the same assets, reusing the same logos, the same colors, the same fonts, and it'll save you a lot of time if you set up a brand kit ahead of time, and then you can just have these ready, already uploaded, already put into Canva to grab from while you're designing. You don't have to go searching for those again. So you can logos, you can create a palette, or you can either set brand fonts, or if Canva doesn't have those fonts within the system, you can upload them. But one thing to note about the brand kit is that it's a premium feature, so you do have to upgrade in order to use this. With that being said, you can still upload logos and use your brand colors and use the fonts within Canva without the brand kit. So you don't have to worry. It's just that you can't set those up ahead of time. So let's look at the Teams tab. This is really great for when you're working with other people. This allows you to share either a link or send, uh, send your teammates your designs with their email. It's really easy, and once you send them this link or send, send it to them through email, then they'll be able to collaborate on the design or leave feedback. So the All Your Folders tab is kind of a catch-all for if you're searching for something, but you don't really know where to find it. It includes the All Your Designs page. This is where what I was talking about with the templates, or I'm sorry, with the Discover. Uh, where you can like things, and then this is where you'll find everything that you've liked. You also have the option to purchase assets within Canva, and this is where you'll find those. Similar to the Teams tab, this is where things that are shared with you from someone else will be. Uploads, pretty self-explanatory, like logos, anything you, you have uploaded yourself within Canva, and then trash. And then we just have another tab for trash. And the one thing that is important with trash is you have 30 days to restore before anything you put in the trash deletes. 
Okay, so let's get started on our first template. The first thing I want to show you is how to create an email header. And for all of these tutorials, we are going to be creating things with the Beekeeper group branding. So once you search for email header and you click within the template that you want, it'll give you either an option to start with a blank canvas or you can start from any of these pre-made templates. For this tutorial, we're going to start with this one. So before we actually get started building and editing this template, I want to touch on what each of these tabs offers. So the tab you start on is templates. And this is basically just the same page that you saw, but way you don't have to navigate back to that page in order to change your template. Uploads is the tab where this is where you can upload your logo or photos or basically anything. The photos tab is where Canva has their library of both free photos and photos that you can pay for. It's really great because Canva does offer a lot of free assets for their users. The elements tab is really nice because it has a lot of different things to look for. It's not just all, in, it's really all encompassing of a lot of different uh, assets. So first you can choose a grid to help you grid your design. You can select a shape that you can use. You can use frames to put photos in, animated stickers, charts, which are really great because you can actually edit them with Canva. And there's so many more. I would really encourage you to just explore this tab and see all that it has to offer. The text tab is where you can put text or you can choose one of their pre-made templates. The music tab is really more for if you're creating either GIFs or video. And the same with video. It they Canva has a variety of different free and paid videos to choose from. The background tab, you can either change the background color from up here, or you can choose any background image. And then finally, the folder tab is where you'll find your purchased assets as well as anything you liked. And the more tab is really just basically everything else that we have to offer. There's a lot to go over here, so I'm not going to touch on everything with this tab. But um, it is really great. I mean, just to touch on a few things, you can add an emoji, you can create QR codes, but this is another that I would encourage exploration on. Okay, so let's actually get started on editing this template. So the first thing that I want to do is change the background to a yellow. So in order to do this, I can either click on the background directly and go up here and just change the color, or I can go over to the background tab and change it from here. The next thing I wanna do is change the fonts. So as you can see, as I'm moving these around, they're moving together, which means that they're grouped. So in order to edit one of them, I want to ungroup them. So I just go up here, hit ungroup, and now I can select them individually. So let's just select this and change it to one of our brand fonts. Perfect. And change it to say a beekeeper group. Next, we'll just change this to say email header and change this to one of our other brand fonts. Great. Okay, so I'm done designing and editing the template on this side, but I do want to change the photo. So let's go to their photo library and search for a beehive. There's a bunch of free photos and you can tell that they're free because they don't have this crown icon. So let's pick this one. And I'm going to drag it over so it snaps into place into the corner but I want this photo to be cropped to the same crop as the photo behind it. So I will double click and then drag it so it fills the whole screen and then drag this secondary frame 
this is the frame that crops the photo to the size of the photo that I, to the size of the crop that I want. And so now I can either click done or I can just click anywhere outside of the, the frame and now it's cropped. So the last thing we'll do is just select the photo, right click, and then I'm going to send this to the back of the order of objects on this artboard. And now I'm just gonna delete the template's initial photo. And now we have our email header. So the next step would be to export, but we're gonna go over exporting in the next tutorial. We don't have to save because Canva auto save. So we're just gonna go back. Now we can see this design in the All Your Designs. It's previewing as the previous design, but if you click on it, then it would pop up with what we just uh, edited it to. Okay, so next we're going to go over how to create a Zoom background. For this, we're gonna start with a blank canvas. So the first thing that I wanna do with the Zoom background is set a background image. So I'm gonna go over the Photos tab. Again, I'm going to search Beehive and I'm going to select a photo. I'm going through the same process that I did in the last one where I'm double clicking, dragging the photo so it's as large as the artboard behind it and then dragging the secondary frame. There we go. One thing to note about using photos in Canva is that say I did not like the way that this photo cropped, all I have to do is double click back in and I can move this around to, to position it however I like. There we go. So now I want to put beekeeper group on it. So I'm gonna add a heading, type in beekeeper group, change the font. Our recently used font is right here. And then I am going to drag this into the corner. You can see the light uh, pink frame around it. That's the margin. It helps uh, create even spacing around the edges. And finally, I want to add a box behind this because the text is not really readable right now. So we're gonna go over to elements, grab a square, and let's change the square to white. And we'll change the text color to black. Okay, so I'm just gonna position this behind the text and then adjust the sizing of it. And then I'm going to grab the text and put this in within the margin. Perfect. So the last thing I wanna go over within this template is adjusting the opacity, which is basically the transparency of an object. So I want the photo behind it to come through. So I select the object and then go up to the checkerboard up here. And that's where I can adjust this. And as you can see, as I'm going down, you can start to see the image through behind it. So I'm only gonna go down to 80. And that way the text is readable, but you still get to see the image. And that's our Zoom background. So let's go over exporting. Exporting is up here in the for a quick export, you can select download and then choose your file type. And then all you have to do is download and this will appear in your download folder. There are a lot of other ways to, uh, to, to share your graphics though. You can download, you can share a link, you could present straight from Canva, you could share via social media, email, Dropbox, and there is even more, so this is another place. Sorry, everyone could please make their lines. Thank you. Okay, so the last thing that I want to go over in Canva is using animations. So I'm going to search animation and then choose animated social media. This is an animated Instagram post. 
within this page, you can't actually preview the animations, but once you click on a template, you can. What's really great about using animations is that they're so easy, you don't have to actually do the work of animating anything. You can basically just pick animations that you like, move them around individually, or resize them as you see fit. So like, this was originally on the word win, but now I want to emphasize the word learn. I can just move that and resize it. It's really nice. Um, and if I want to add any additional animations, I just go to elements and then I can search animated. So there it looks like there are a couple of different free options. So all I have to do is select and then resize. It's very easy, very straightforward, not intimidating at all once you start to use it. And there you go. So for exporting animations, it works pretty similarly to exporting um, static graphics. You basically just have different file type options. And those really depend on what platform you're sharing on. In addition, you can still do all of the alternate options like sharing or sharing with social media, etc. And that's all I have for you for the Canva tutorial. But I'd be happy to answer any questions. And Casey would also be happy to answer any additional questions. On the Thank you so much. That was great. Oh, I did want to highlight a few things in the chat box um, that are really help helpful. Uh, Dean actually figured out that Canva Premium is free for non uh, for registered nonprofits. So please take advantage of that. You can get um, the additional features. Um, Let's see, also a 60 second demo of resizing would be helpful if you could share that. Resizing, I'm guessing in terms of maybe taking an Instagram post to Twitter. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So with resizing, you will need to create two different graphics, but let, like, let's say I wanted to resize this, or actually let's work with a non-animated Let's say we wanted to resize this graphic into um, a Facebook graphic. So all you would have to do is go over, go back to the home page, search Facebook. There we go, Facebook post. Choose a blank template. And then it's really easy in Canva to just copy and paste between designs. So all you would do is just I'm going to set the background color to be the same. And so I chose this default yellow, but if you chose a specific color, you can also go into and find the hex code and just copy and paste there. Or you can go and copy and paste text. So because they're different pixel sizes, they'll come in at different sizes, but you can just resize very easily. And so in order to recreate the whole graphic, you would basically just copy and paste and find different positioning for all of the objects, depending on how different the dimensions of the different graphics are. Oh, that's cool. So Dean uses the resize button to the, by the right of, and home and everything uh, copies automatically over. That's really cool. So when you're, this oh, is actually- oh, yeah. Looks like oh, it's a really? premium feature, but oh, that sounds cool. like a great feature. That's cool. So this is what we were talking about earlier about platforms and oh. dimensions. It's a great thing to think um, about. When I can take it out back. It's in the alley. So you can just so yeah. So using different platforms, how you're going to go from Thank one you to the so other, much. and have an idea ahead of time of how you want to if you want to remove things around because not everything that works in a uh, like a, a social share graphic is going to work on a LinkedIn graphic about your flexibility still saying still staying consistent that's great does anyone have any other questions i know we have uh, just a minute left you know there to, uh, canva has a pretty robust um kind of blog 
updates. A lot of the examples that I, um, the tools and tips that I pulled from today are resources within Canva um, that you can go look there for tutorials and those things. Like it has a color contraster, it has um, a color wheel. You want to learn more about like it really is a nice kind of closed all in one design like so definitely look for some tutorials there about how to use it I'm sure all that. and that's great well if anyone has any additional questions um or if you would like a part two of this type of demonstration please let us know <laughs> excuse me and um, we'll put up our email addresses if anyone wants to get in touch with additional questions. We are going to pause for August um, and then we will be back with the biotechnical lab. Um, so we appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for the presentations. It was really, really great. And I, I think we can now leave here um, and really take our graphic abilities to the next level. So, all right, everyone have a great rest of the day. Okay. Here we go. All right. Jump.